Turn to Proverbs 7 and verse 10. This will be the last one for tonight. It says, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. So let's just start out with those first two words, and behold. Behold is the imperative of the preceding verb used to call attention. So Solomon is calling attention to the situation. And behold, so pay attention. Look what I'm about ready to tell you about. He's calling his son's attention to one of the most obvious indicators that a woman is a whore, and that is her clothing. That is the, probably the number one giveaway that a woman is a whore, is how she dresses. You do not generally see whores dressed in a nice, modest dress or something like that. That, that, that doesn't happen. They are dressed to allure. It says, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot. Attire is equipment of man or horse outfit for war. Now you might say, well, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make sense. She's not wearing, uh, she's not outfitted for war. Well, you know what it says at the end of the chapter? It says she's cast down many wounded. Many strong men are slain by her. She is ready for war. Uh, secondly, though, it's personal adornment or decoration, get up. Also with the plural an ornament. And then three, it's dress or apparel. So it's referring to what she's wearing, her clothing, in other words. And her clothing is her battle clothing as well, because she is out to slay her some men. So she has the attire of a harlot. A harlot, this is interesting too, number one. I like to give you number one if I use a different one, just to show you why I'm using a different one. Uh, It is a vagabond, beggar, rogue, rascal, villain, low fellow, knave. In later use, in the 16th and 17th centuries, sometimes a man of loose life, a fornicator, also often a mere term of opprobrium or insult. So it's interesting, a harlot, primarily, number one, doesn't even refer to a woman. Um, It's used in the scripture uh, referring to women, uh, frequently, and I will sh- the dictionary will show that too. Uh, but but f- number five, it's applied to a woman, which is the context here. It's a general term of execration, specifically an unchaste woman, a prostitute, a strumpet. Then it says very frequently in 16th century Bible versions where Wycliffe had whore. Um, it's probably a less offensive word, it says. So that, according to the dictionary anyway. But uh, other versions use the word whore, but whore and and harlot are uh, synonyms. They're the same thing. So she's got the attire of a harlot, which is a prostitute. And prostitutes wear revealing, sexually provocative clothing. They wear low-cut shirts, which show their cleavage. They wear short shirts, uh, which show their midsection. They wear miniskirts and short shorts, which show their thighs. They wear tight clothing, uh, which shows the contours of their bodies. In other words, prostitutes dress a whole lot like most American women do these days, especially in the summertime. I have a feeling, and I can't prove this because I was not around 3,000 years ago, but I would be willing to bet that the average teenage girl at the mall today in the summertime is probably dressed more like a harlot than harlots were dressed like harlots 3,000 years ago. I'll bet you they're dressed more revealingly than harlots were 3,000 years ago. I would be willing to bet a sum of money on that. I have a feeling if Paul and the other apostles came here to 21st century America and walked around in a mall in the summertime or anywhere, uh, they would be probably shocked. Although there was a lot of wicked sin going on back then, but just the way that people dress today, I'm, I'm guessing is probably a lot worse than it was then. I don't think you would see anything like what you see out in public here except at one of those banquets like what uh, where uh, the girl asked, the dancing girl asked for John the Baptist's head. Right. That's yeah. the only place you'd see what we see now. Yeah. Not yeah. out on the streets. I'm, I think you're probably right. So a Christian woman should never wear clothing that shows her cleavage, her belly, her thighs, or clothing that is extremely tight so that all the contours of her body can be clearly seen. Uh, That is the attire of a harlot. 
So men, if you see a woman dressed like this, stay far away from her. Proverbs 5 and verse 8. Remove thy way far from her and come not nigh the door of her house. This is not a good woman. She may look attractive, but a, a godly man should be looking for a wife, not a woman like that. Uh, and just think about it. I realize that we're both, the two men here tonight are obviously married, but for young, any young person that might hear this, and there could be plenty of them out there, if you think about it, if the woman that you are dating now dresses like she does now, if she, is she going to continue to dress like that? Well, probably. After you get married, she's going to dress like she does now. And then who's she going to be attracting? Well, maybe you, but every other man that sees her too. Why would you want to date a girl that dresses in such a way that after you were married, men are going to be staring at her and lusting after her? You know, I certainly wouldn't want to. So what a woman says outwardly reveals what's in her heart. Luke 6 and verse 45. Luke 6 and verse 45. See, what, what's on the outside expresses, reveals what's on the inside. Luke 6, 45, Jesus said, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. So what a person says tells you what's in their heart. Well, what a woman wears also tells you what's in her heart. Because... If she has godliness in her heart, she's going to want to dress the way that the Bible says she should dress. She's going to want to be modestly uh, clothed. And if she's not, that means that she has, at best, foolishness in her heart, and at worst, just outright sinfulness. Like, she's trying to attract men by dressing like that. A godly submissive woman with a meek and quiet spirit wears modest clothing, which doesn't draw attention to herself. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 2 through 6. This is the difference between the godly woman and the strange woman. The type of work she does, the type of clothes she wears, the type of things she says, which we'll get into the things that she says uh, later in this study. All these things are indicative of a strange woman. 1 Peter 3, 2 through 6. It says, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. He's writing to uh, Christian women. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair. That's like braiding the hair. Or of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner also the old... Uh, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. How far did I want to read? Yeah, just to verse 6. Okay. So, godly women are adorned in two different ways. They're adorned spiritually with a meek and quiet spirit. They're not loud and stubborn like the strange woman in, in Proverbs Uh, chapter 7. They're not unsubmissive and unruly and telling their husband how it's going to be and and back-talking him and and just being contrary to him all the time, especially in front of other people. That's not a godly woman. Now, a godly woman can express disagreement with her husband, but there's a big difference between that and and being mouthy. Um, That's not what a godly woman is like. And then secondly, a godly woman also adorns herself with modest apparel, and I'll get to that verse uh, in a minute. These, this verse is not saying that you can never braid your hair um, or that you can never wear gold, uh, never wear jewelry or anything, because it also says, or of putting on of apparel. So if you're, you're going to forbid all wearing of gold, all braiding of hair, you're going to forbid all putting on of clothing, and that's going to be a problem. So, But it is referring to that that a woman's adorning primarily, she shouldn't be all about her outward appearance. So it shouldn't be all about wearing flashy and showy and very, you know, clothing that even if it's not a modest, that it's going to attract the looks of everybody and have them gawk at her. Um, And she shouldn't be just all about her looks like a lot of, especially younger girls are, right? They're all the makeup, all the braided hair, all the, everything is done so that people will look at them and be 
uh, that, that it'll, it'll feed their ego, their pride, basically. Um, that's not what a godly woman should be. An ungodly, unchaste, loud, stubborn woman dresses immodestly to draw attention to herself. Remember Proverbs seven ten through eleven, that he met her. There met him there a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. And then the next verse, in verse eleven, says she is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. So it's interesting there that these two things go together and they're opposites. Loud and stubborn and the attire of an harlot. Meek and quiet spirit and adorned in modest apparel. So um, you, chances are when you find one, you're going to find the other. You find a loud and stubborn woman, chances are she's probably wearing clothing that she shouldn't. And it's going to be immodest and it's um, going to be drawing attention to her body parts. You find a woman of a meek and quiet spirit, chances are she's not going to be, her boobs aren't going to be hanging out and you're not going to see the bottom of her butt cheeks because she's wearing shorts that are so short and things like that. And pretty much see what's going on inside of her heart by what is what she's clothed by. Now, if a woman dresses immodestly, showing cleavage, thighs, etc., then there's a high likelihood that she's not a godly woman. She could just be deceived, grew up in this culture, doesn't know any different. That's, that's quite possible. But there's a pretty good likelihood that she's probably not a godly woman. Like I alluded to, Christian women should be adorned in modest apparel. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 9. Paul says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but as women professing godliness with good works. Same exact thing that Peter was saying there. These are basically parallel texts. Modest, when we're speaking of women, their attributes and behavior, it's governed by the proprieties of the sex, decorous in manner and conduct, not forward, impudent, or lewd. Remember the, remember the uh, strange woman? A few verses later it says, And with an impudent face she said unto him, I have peace offerings with me, so on. Modest is not forward, not impudent. The strange woman was forward. She runs right up to him and she starts talking. She starts throwing herself at him. That's not what a modest woman does. At least not to a stranger. You know, within marriage, that's, that's perfectly fine. But not to a stranger. Hence, in latter use, also a man scrupulously chaste in feeling, language, and conduct, shrinking from coarse or impure suggestion. Now, a female attire, which is what Paul is referring to here, modest apparel, it is decent, not meretricious. Meretricious is of, pertaining to, characteristic of, or befitting a harlot, having the characteristic of a harlot. So, in other words, women are not to be ordained in clothing that a harlot would wear, which is what I already mentioned earlier. Showing cleavage, skin, basically. Skin anywhere from, you know, your chest above the breast down to your knees. When you're showing that skin, you're um, adorning yourself like a harlot. So therefore, Christian women should not be dressed like a harlot, obviously, which is what the verse says. It says that she had the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. Subtle is of thin consistency, tenuous, not dense, rarefied, hence penetrating, pervasive, or elusive by reason of tenuity, now chiefly of odors. Now, there's a reason, once again, I gave you that definition because that's referring to a physical uh, definition, like if an odor is of a thin consistency, or I think of, that just reminds me of WD-40, right? WD-40 would be subtle. It's a thin consistency. It gets easily down and it penetrates down inside cracks and crevices, and, and it's uh, very pervasive and elusive. Um, a strange woman is like that in a immaterial sense. Of immaterial things, it's not easily grasped, understood, or perceived, intricate, obtruse. <clears throat> now, strange woman is like that. It says that her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. She's not easy to grasp. She's not easy to figure out sometimes. Um, she can put on a pretty good front. 
of persons or animals, it's crafty, cunning, treacherously or wickedly cunning, insidiously sly, or wily. So she's tricky. She's got tricks up her sleeves. She has language that um, might make you think that she's something that she's not. Like, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. She sounds religious. We'll get into that verse later. Um, So she's tricky. She's sly. She's cunning. Not so easy to figure out if you're I guess if you're dense and you can't see she's dressed like a harlot and you know, that should be a giveaway, but you know, if, if, if you, maybe you're blind or something, um, her language might not give it away just right away until she starts talking about her bed. And then you probably ought to figure, well, you know, maybe she's not exactly a good woman if she's uh, telling me about her bed in our first conversation. We'll get to that later too. So she's crafty and deceitful like her father, the devil. Second Corinthians 11 and verse 3. Makes perfect sense. The devil's subtle. Remember, he was, came in the form of a serpent, and the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And the devil deceived Eve through his subtlety. First, Second Corinthians 11.3 But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The devil's subtle. And here the strange woman, who's a child of the devil. She's subtle too. Tricky, sly, cunning. Like I said, Proverbs 5, 6 says, Her ways are immovable that thou canst not know them. Her heart is full of snares and nets, which she uses to catch unsuspecting men. Look at Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 26. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 26. Sorry, it's taking me a second. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 26. Solomon said, And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, and her hands is bands. Whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. See, she's elusive. She's not easy to identify. She's crafty, wickedly cunning, insidiously sly. She's wily. She's, she can catch you. Her hands are... Her heart is snares and nets, like she's got traps set for you that you don't see. That's the whole idea of a snare and a net, right? They're, they're set and they're hidden. She's got a hidden agenda. She's ready to catch you, to trick you, to snare you, to take you and destroy you. And a wise man will stay far away from her. Proverbs seven twenty four through 27. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her way, her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. So the best way to deal with her is the same way you deal with the devil, to uh, avoid him, to stay away from him. Uh, to uh, resist the devil and he'll flee from you, right? Do the same thing with a strange woman. Stay away from her and you won't be deceived by her. So next time we'll look at Proverbs 7 and verse 11. Just a quick note at the end of the sermon. The most important thing a believer in Jesus Christ can do is to be a member of one of God's true churches. If you're not already a member of one, go to pastorwagner.com slash churches to see if there is a true church or other believers of like faith near you. That's pastorwagner.com slash churches.